Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you, many of you uh, who have been following this program uh, for quite some time now. I'm extremely grateful to each and every one of you who have been joining uh, this program and participating in it. Uh, I know that uh, what makes this program special is the fact that we are all doing it together. Uh, it's not just only me alone uh, who is uh, doing this, but we are doing it together and we are having a conversation, educating each other. So I'm extremely grateful uh, for each of you. Uh, normally we do, for the last uh, few Sundays, we have been doing it uh, in the morning here in Washington DC time and in the afternoon in Juba. Uh, but today, uh, due to uh, scheduling issues uh, and of course being a church, uh, I had to be at church and to take kids to church. And this is the reason why we have postponed our program to uh, the afternoon. And I know now is at night uh, in Juba. So thank you, those of you who are tuning in. Uh, we appreciate that. Those of you who are tuning in from around the world, from the diaspora, uh, we appreciate uh, uh, you giving us your time and to participate in this conversation. As I've been saying, uh, please uh, go ahead, share the video, uh, and also engage. Uh, make sure that your voice is heard. Let's have a conversation. It's not just only about me lecturing and talking, but it's about us having feedback uh, with one another. Uh, let it not be a surprise uh, that the regime in Juba, as you know, has completely destroyed the country. Uh, they have uh, mismanaged the economy. They have engaged in massive amount of corruption. Uh, they have led uh, our, our nation to a complete uh, total darkness. Uh, they are arming communities uh, and encouraging them to engage in violence and to kill one another. They are looting the nation, as you know very well. They have sold the natural resources of the country, uh, including oil. Uh, the, they have also sold the water. And as you know very well, uh, they have all even gone to the extent of selling the land of South Sudan, uh, allowing our borders uh, to be annexed uh, by Kenya and by Uganda and pretty much by everyone else. Uh, so this is a regime that will go at every length uh, to sell the nation. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I posted uh, the corruption network of Salvakir and his family. And you can see there all the children, as I was saying the other day, all the children, they are all running mad in the market. Uh, they are grabbing everything that they can. They are doing businesses, most of them very fake businesses, engaging with all kinds of nationalities. And uh, when we mention this, so their supporters uh, accuse us. You know, they feel like uh, everyone that is angry with Salvakir is angry uh, because they also want to eat. Uh, they don't understand that many of us stand for principle and they throw anything at us, uh, including terrible accusation. Uh, but you know very well uh, that uh, these accusations are all baseless. Uh, they are completely uh, accusations that are made up. They throw every single dirt uh, at us and see what will stick. Uh, but I assure you, my people, anyone in South Sudan, if you go to any uh, institutions in the government, uh, especially Ministry of Justice, and search for companies, you will not find my name there. Uh, anybody that have ever gotten any contract from the government. Uh, although I had so much opportunities to do so, I chose not to do so. And because I don't actually need it, I don't need money from the Kir government, I don't need money uh, from the regime of South Sudan. Uh, what we want to see is to see a country that is prosperous, uh, to make sure that the millions of South Sudanese people that sacrificed their life for South Sudan to be free get to enjoy the benefit of living in a free nation. We want to build wealth in South Sudan, uh, to create prosperity for young people, to create jobs, to create training opportunities so that we empower our people and make sure that South Sudan will become a great nation as uh, we know that it can be. Uh, because South Sudanese people are great people. We are blessed with everything. It's not just the natural resources. Those are not the primary resources of our nation. The primary resources of our, of our nation are the people of South Sudan. Uh, our people, these are the most vital resource that the country has, our people and our land. It's because of our people and our land that we are a people. And this is why it is so painful uh, when Salvakir allowed the borders of South Sudan to be annexed uh, so that a uh, country like Kenya, country like Uganda, they take our borders. Uh, this one is unacceptable. And as I mentioned last time, we will not allow a single inch of our territory to be taken by anybody. 
and we will reject any attempt whatsoever to annex our territories. This is something that we will never accept as the people of South Sudan. Not even a single inch of our land will be taken by anyone by force. Uh, this is a land that God bless us with, is a land that is blessed, is a land uh, that is resourceful, is a land that is as black as we are. And the people of South Sudan, as I said before, are the greatest assets that we have. We are a very different race among all the people of the country. I mean, among all the people of, the, of Africa. Uh, we South Sudanese people, we are unique by our features, by our dignity, by our honor, by our hospitality. These are the values now that have been eroded by this regime of Salva Kiir that has turned our people into psychopaths, people that only bake after resources, people that sing praises to individuals. We are people that only revere God Almighty. We don't revere a human being. All of us as human beings, we are equal, and we were created by the one loving God, God that placed us in our land. And it's the same God that we all worship. So my people, uh, what we are doing here, it may appear to some people as if we are wasting our time and we are doing nothing. But what we are doing here is we are engaging in conversation. We are soul searching. We are trying to understand how did this mighty nation got to its knees, the way that now the nation has been turned into a nation of liars, a uh, nation of thieves, and the nation of murderers. Uh, this is what we are trying to soul search. And we are trying to find our footing. How do we recover from where we are? How do we regain our greatness? How do we make South Sudan mighty again? This is what we are trying to do, and this is what we are engaging in. And I welcome each and every one of you to engage in the conversation. We don't claim monopoly of any knowledge. We as individuals, uh, all of us, regardless of our level of education, we have something to learn from one another. And we can only build our nation if we continue to learn from one another. What, what I'm doing here is to initiate a conversation, to facilitate a conversation, converse, conversation that each and every one of us has something to contribute to. It doesn't matter uh, where you come from. It doesn't matter what your age. It doesn't matter what your level of education. It doesn't matter what is your religion. It doesn't matter what your tribe is. It doesn't matter what your region is. As long as you are South Sudanese, as in as long as that fire of patriotism burn in your heart, you are in the right place. Uh, let's continue to learn from one another. Let's engage with one another. And feel free to leave comments, make videos of your own. We welcome that. Uh, we want a nation where people can express themselves, where people can talk with one another, confront each other with the truth, with the facts. And through that, those facts, we are able to liberate our nation from this dictatorship. So let me welcome uh, those of you who have, been, who have joined and those of you who are watching. Uh, please go ahead, uh, share the video. Uh, share it on WhatsApp, share it on uh, Messenger, share it on your wall, uh, share it as, as, as often as possible so that people of South Sudan uh, may have access to this conversation. Uh, as I said, we will continue this series for as long as necessary. And we are doing this to create awareness, to create a conversation so that all our people are aware uh, of uh, the mistakes that are happening in our country and why we must come to the single most important conclusion. There is no reform whatsoever that can take place in South Sudan with Salva Kiir is still in charge. It doesn't matter what it is. If we want to build our economy, we cannot rebuild our economy with Salva Kiir in charge. If we want to rebuild our security institutions and bring security and stability to South Sudan, we cannot do so with Salva Kiir in charge. If we want to uh, clean up our environment, we cannot do that with Salva Kiir in charge. If we want to stop intercommunal violence in the country, we cannot do that with, Sal with Salva Kiir in charge. If we want to repair our relations with the rest of the world, we cannot do that with Salva Kiir in charge. If we want to regain our honor and our dignity among all the peoples of Africa and the people of the world, we cannot do that with Salva Kiir in charge. That is the whole point of everything we are doing. Every conversation we are having, regardless of whatever topic we are having, whether it is on the issues of econ economy, management of finances and currency, uh, issues of health, uh, issues of education, uh, whatever issue that we have been discussing so far, there is no way whatsoever we can make any progress on anything while Salva Kiir in charge. Therefore, the whole point of everything we are discussing is to come to the same conclusion, 
to make sure that there is consensus among the people of South Sudan that Salva Kiir must be removed. This is the imminent uh, matter that needs to be resolved. And we want to engage in this conversation so that there is no doubt whatsoever of what needs to be done. No reform, nothing whatsoever can take place in this country with Salva Kiir in charge. He has to be removed. And his removal is the beginning of our recovery, is the beginning of us regaining our pride and our dignity so that we may stand tall in our own nation among our brothers in Africa and among the rest of humanity. That is the whole point of what we are doing. If anyone that is not yet convinced, we will continue to educate, to bring more evidence, uh, to share more information about how this individual, Cole Salvaquir, has been really a fifth columnist uh, among our people. He has been using every single opportunity to drill the efforts of South Sudanese people to unite themselves and to develop their nation and to rise among the communities of nation. He has to be removed. That is the essence of everything that we are doing. So once again, I welcome you and I thank you uh, for coming here. I encourage you uh, to engage in a conversation. If there are matograp that continue to come and create chaos and try to uh, uh, mislead our people, let's correct them. Let's engage them in the conversation. Let's challenge them to produce any evidence. Let's challenge them to show us how has Salva Kiir succeeded? How has the life of South Sudanese people been made better under his leadership? And I will show you all the evidence of how we as people of South Sudan has been reduced to beggars under the leadership of Salva Kiir and how we need to remove him so that we may recover and we may build a great nation, a nation that God Almighty has uh, prophesied uh, through Isaiah uh, as a mighty nation, fear far and wide, a nation that is flowing with milk and honey. That is the nation that is awaiting us, and we cannot begin to build it while this man is in charge. So thank you very much for coming here. Let's continue to have a conversation, and let's continue to educate some of these matokrap. Some of them, they have lost their souls. They have sold their soul for money. Some of them are blinded by tribalism. Some of them are blinded by regionalism. Some of them are blinded by clanism. Uh, some of these people are hopeless, and we'll have to remove them together with Salva Kiir. But those, of, those others that still have years, but simply they have been misled, and they have been fed with propaganda, we can engage them with facts, and with the facts, we should be able to convince them if they have a heart and if they love this nation and if they love their fellow citizens of South Sudan. One cannot do this without love in, in, in his or her heart. It's only through love that we can come to this con conclusion. If we are just blinded by sectionalism, by regionalism, by tribalism, we will not be able to see the truth. So it requires us to really look inside our heart and feel that presence of God Almighty within us to allow us to see the truth before us and then be able to react to it. So thank you. Share the video. Uh, let's make sure that everyone is engaged. Now, as all of you know, our conversation today is on South Sudan foreign policy or South Sudan external relations. Uh, South Sudan, as you know very well, is a nation that is landlocked. Uh, it's a small country, relatively speaking, especially in the term of the GDP, growth domestic product. Uh, we are among the poorest countries in the world. And in fact, since we got our independence, uh, poverty has been going up. Uh, the overall economic productivity of South Sudan has been going down. And this has been largely due to uh, poor governance and the poor leadership of President Kiir. Uh, so now, uh, although when we got our nation, uh, we, when we got our independence in 2011, the poverty rate was only 50% of the population. As we speak, poverty rate is uh, nearly 90% of the population. In fact, Nine out of 10 South Sudanese people are living, as we speak, in extreme poverty. Uh, this is largely due to uh, poverty. So we are a poor uh, nation uh, that is a landlock. We have to rely on other nations uh, to be able to take our products uh, to global markets. So for example, the main product now that South Sudan relies on is the oil. And the only way we can sell the oil is through Sudan, because we are a landlocked nation. That's why the pipeline run from the oil fields in southern Sudan all the way uh, to uh, Red Sea uh, in the Port Sudan. Uh, simultaneously, for us to buy products, 
uh, whether it is medicine or other things that we need, they have to be brought uh, from other countries. So we are in a nation that is landlocked. Also, as you know, we are a nation that emerged out of a struggle against colonialism and against mar marginalization by the Arabs uh, in the north. And for us to fight for our independence, uh, we couldn't do it alone. Uh, let no one tell you that we were the one that did it alone. We didn't do it alone. Uh, first of all, you know very well this country, we don't make any AK-47s, we don't make any guns, we don't manufacture them. So we must have gotten, gotten them somewhere else. And to get them somewhere else requires relations, it requires partnership, it requires friendship with other nations. Uh, so uh, as a part of this liberation struggle, we had to build allies and we have to sell our, uh, our ideas uh, to other people around the world. Uh, we have to sell why we were struggling. We have to sell our vision, what we stood for as a people of South Sudan. And it's because of that vision that other people were impressed with our vision and what we wanted to do with our nation, what we wanted to do our, with ourselves. Uh, we were complaining of marginalization and we wanted to have the opportunity uh, to have freedom so that we can build a nation that works for our people, so that we may be able to empower our people, so that we can educate our people and deliver services to our people. Uh, we wanted to build a nation uh, where every single citizen was equal. Uh, it didn't matter what your tribe would be, or your religion, or your ethnicity, or your region. This was not to be a nation where some people feel that they are better than other people. It was a nation where all the citizens will feel that they are one and the same, and they will be one and the same before the law, that they will be judged only by the content of their character, and not necessarily by who they are and where they come from, or the agenda, or anything whatsoever. All these subjectivities, they were not to be a factor. We were only going to look at each other as one common citizen with a common destiny, because that is the truth. We are one people, we are equal, and we have one destiny as South Sudanese people. So this vision, we were able to sell it to the rest of the world. Mangistu was impressed with it. He supported us. And then later on, after we left uh, Mangistu, we had other people that supported us, including uh, our neighbors, uh, Kenya, Uganda. Uh, they hosted a lot of South Sudanese refugees for many years. And they provided both diplomatic and material support to the SPLM, SPLA, so that we, as people of South Sudan, uh, may liberate ourselves, Eritrea, all our neighbors, and primarily also the Troika of the United States, United Kingdom, and Norway. They came to our defense because they agreed with our vision. They were impressed by the righteousness of our struggle. It wasn't simply because they liked us and they hate those other people. Uh, it was because the, there was something that impressed them about our vision, about our struggle. We wanted to bring freedom uh, this is a common human desire. It doesn't matter where you go to around the world. You will find every single human being that God has created is aspiring to be free so that they can be able to express themselves, so that they can be able to pursue whatever potential that God has given each and every single one of them. So this vision rhymed very much with countries like the United States, a uh, country that was also built on aspirations for freedom, uh, countries like the United Kingdom that wanted to uh, change how they have conducted the affairs for many, many, many years and wanted also to become a beacon of democracy. Countries like Norway and so many other countries in the world. It is because of that vision that the relations that John Grang were able to develop with his supporters, uh, people that came to work with him, uh, those of Deng Alor, Paul Nyal Deng Nyal, uh, uh, Aziz, uh, Yusuf Kwam Meki, Yasser Arman, and so many others. They were able to build these relations with the rest of the world that allow them to support us materially, financially, and diplomatically so that we ultimately were able to achieve CPA. Uh, CPA was not only achieved through the battlefield. The battlefield play a major role. And even the budget, for the battlefield to play a major role, it requires uh, equipment. It requires weapons and ammunition and financial resources to empower our people to fight uh, without material, without the equipment, we would have never been able to fight. But because of those relations, which were only forged by the power of the vision of the new Sudan, that is why all these people were able to gather uh, and support the cause of South Sudan. And that is why the Igad nations were impressed with our, with our struggle. 
And that's why, regardless of how much uh, the Khartoum regime wanted uh, to reject our aspiration of self-determination, they had to relent because the rest of the world was convinced that we, as a South Sudanese people, we were, a, we were a distinct nation, we were a distinct people, and therefore we deserve to have a right to pursue our own destiny and build a future of freedom uh, and escape the nation of Sudan where we were treated as only second-class citizens. So my people, uh, it is because of that vision and those relations that we as a people of South Sudan were ultimately able uh, to deliver the CPA and also because of those relationships. That's why we were able to hold the feet of Jalaba to the implementation of the CPA, including the conduct of the referendum in 2011. Without those relationships, referendum would have not been possible. Without those relationships, the material support that our soldiers needed on the ground would have not been possible. Without those relationships, the humanitarian support that we received, that kept our people alive and gave them hope during difficult times, we would have not been able to receive it. So, South Sudan is a nation that was born as a result of the struggle of the South Sudanese people on one hand, and on the other, the support of the international community. And what glued them together, both the South Sudanese people, so that they could support the liberation agenda and the external actors that provided us with the material support so that we may succeed, it was the vision, the vision of what we wanted to do. That vision appealed to our citizens, and it allowed them, all of them, to rally behind the leadership of the SPLM, SPLA. And that same vision was able to appeal to the international community and allow them, all of them, to support John Grang and the vision of the SPLM, SPLM. John Grang was able to present a counter vision to the vision that the North Sudan has presented for so many years. And that was a, a vision of building a, mono, a, a, a homogeneous, uh, monolithic Arab nation in which we as African Christians were relegated to the status of second-class citizens. John Grant countered it with a powerful vision, a vision that came only out of love, vision of building a nation of equals, a nation that is united in purpose, a nation where people were judged by the content of their character. And that vision prevailed. That vision was able to win support, including even among the Arab nations. And it's because of that power of that vision that South Sudan is today a nation. So when we raised our flag in July 9, uh, 2011, you saw what happened at John Grand Mausoleum. All the dignitaries of the world, they came to celebrate with us. It was a celebration of, of, of freedom. It was a celebration of success. A success where everyone was able to congratulate themselves. Those who stood with us, the friends of us that stood with us, and even our enemies, they had no choice but to celebrate because we were able to, to prevail regardless of whatever tactics of division, tribalism, regionalism, ethnicity that were played against us. And despite the best efforts of Jalaba to divide our people and to continue to suppress them, what happened after we got our independence? Immediately after we got our independence, that's when the external relations of South Sudan begin to deteriorate. Why did they deteriorate? They deteriorated because Sin Salvakir took over. And this is a surprise to many of us because for many years he had been at the high command and for many years he has been the deputy of John Grang, the single deputy of John Grang. Many of us expected him to know, to internalize the vision of the SPLM, the vision of New Sudan. And we expected that once, that once we were able to liberate ourselves and raise our flag as a nation, that he was now going to act on this vision. What was this vision? First of all, is the vision of freedom. It was ensuring that South Sudanese people were free and that through freedom, they will be able to shape their own destiny. They will be able to develop themselves. Development was core to it. Roads were supposed to be built. The oil was to be used as a tool to connect the nation, to empower agriculture, to empower livestock, to educate the people of South Sudan, to provide them with uh, all uh, the necessities of life so that they may enjoy prosperity in their own land. 
That never happened. Immediately, it was all about corruption. Salva Kiir, as I showed the map before, and you just look at that map of him and his family, creating companies, beginning to think as if South Sudan is theirs alone, for them to own, for them to exploit. Division, arming of militias, like the way Yao Yao has been used as a project for many years to keep the whole of Jongle and Upper Nile unstable, uh, the way in which communities are uh, made to fight each other, like what is happening now in Warab between Tweet Mayadit and, uh, and uh, Abiyai community, what is happening between a Pugirthik and Marial Wau community, what is happening between a Gwok and Kwanya Yok. All of these are tactics that are engineered in Juba by politicians who do not want to allow the people of South Sudan to see the benefit of New Sudan the power of that vision which allowed the nation to be born in the first place. So Bakir turned his back on it. And immediately what happened was the abandonment of South Sudan from the international stage. And there is a powerful point to be made here. After all, what is foreign policy? Foreign policy is an extension of domestic policy. Uh, you cannot pursue foreign policy uh, in vacuum. It is what you do inside the nation that drives what you do from outside. Because diplomats that are deployed outside are there to basically help the nation to realize the national policy. SPLM articulated a national policy that was based on the vision of New Sudan. You can go back and read the documents that were developed by John Grant. And by the way, God bless him, even when he died, he left everything. Even that plane crash, when it crashed, yes, it killed him. But his laptop, his, his laptop, the laptop that he used that had everything in it, was there. Even his private pistol that he used to carry it was never destroyed. So the laptop was taken and the pistol and given to Salva Kiir. Everything was there. The vision was there. All the plans were there. What to be done was there. But he was not interested in that. He was only interested in corruption. He was interested in power, personal power. And he wanted to use regionalism, especially in a form of Bargazalism, and tribalism in the form of Dinkaism, as a way of keeping himself in power. That is it. He had no interest in uniting the nation, in continuing that vision that had united the people of South Sudan for so long. He had no interest. And he wanted to use terrible episodes of division in the past to continue to remind South Sudanese people of why they couldn't be together, why they must fight each other, as he did in 2013. So what happened? All these nations of the world that stood with us, they began to wonder, this is not what you told us that you were going to do. This is not the vision that you told us. You told us you were going to have a free nation. What happened immediately? Immediately, the national security, instead of being developed as institution that would care about the security of the people of South Sudan, human security as its focus, it was reduced to regime security, keeping Salva Kiir in power, suppressing the critics of Salva Kiir. Less than a year, just one year after the independence, Political assassination began to happen. You all remember Isaiah Abraham, Isaiah Ding Chana was, was murdered in his house by direct orders of Salva Kiir, executed by the National Security Service. This happened. And then massive corruption. In fact, this massive corruption has been happening during the CPA period. And even the donors themselves were concerned about it. And that's why immediately after independence, there was a lot of pressure on Salva Kiir to start fighting corruption. You remember the letter to 75 individuals that allegedly stole four billion? You remember? Yes, it was because already corruption was already a problem uh, within the government. You remember the story I told you about Madame Aoud uh, raising an issue during the National Liberation Council meeting in 2012 regarding the roads, how the road that the American built 
the Juba Numeli high, Highway, the cost of it was only one third of the per, per kilometer. It was only one third of what Bull Mill was charging when he still had the ABMC, that company. And what did Gear say, who was the Minister of Road? He said, I am not the one who gave the contract to Bull Mill. In fact, Bull Mill did not receive this contract through bidding, competitive bidding. We were ordered by Salva Kiir. The president wrote the letter to the Minister of Roads, and he said, give this contract to Bull Mill. So that is what we did. And Bull Mill will be the one to determine what is the price. Corruption. Look at that network, that, that, uh, that picture that I posted on my wall just a few before we started. You will see every, most of every single child of Salvaquir there engaging in corruption, having access to companies, having partners from all over the world, companies that we are unable to see, companies that have no prosperity to the people of South Sudan. Corruption became the focus. Development? Well, tell us, where is it? Schools are not there. Basic drink water, drinking water is not there. What happened last week? The economic cluster decided to buy trucks, more trucks, so that they could distribute water uh, in Juba, to use 9 million US dollars, which they could actually use to build a real, bring pipes, and build a proper water infrastructure in Juba. Juba is the only capital in the world where there is no running water. It's supplied with tankers. Sewage. No sewage system. You only have to get like tankers to come and pull out sewage and take it to the Ye Road, then dump it everywhere. And sanitary. It's embarrassing for the entire nation. It's embarrassing. Even in our culture, people hide. Even back then when there was no latrines and toilets, you go deep in the bush so that no one will see what you do and where your business is. Even dog, when they go, they, they dig a, a little hole and they, they, they do their business and then they hide it. You don't go and take the waste, human waste, and dump it on the road so that everyone can see it, everyone can smell it. It's shameful. And that is what this nation has been reduced to under the leadership of Salva Kiir. In fact, that is the example, really the image of the country. His own village, I went there, I couldn't, no drinking water. Drinking water is not there. People have to walk, M women have to walk for so long to go and drink, in, to, get, to get water, you know? So nothing whatsoever. So oil is flowing in, billions of money is flowing in every single month. Sometimes $600 million, $700 million, $800 million is coming in on a monthly basis. And this money is disappearing. It's being stolen. It's being siphoned off to different countries. It is this, country, this money now that has led to all this development that you see in Kenya, in Uganda, in Ethiopia. All these nations, they are prospering off us as a people of South Sudan. My people, my people. We have to wake up. Foreign policy, you cannot just go and lie to the world. All these countries in the world, they have embassies in Juba. They have a way of finding out what you are doing inside. When the war happened in 2013, what happened? President Kiir had pl been planning this for months. Mapyanganyor had been recruited privately, trained by Paul Malongawan uh, in uh, 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 Wunjik, uh, in a, in a, in a Will, Will East. And uh, when they were ready, they were armed and given a specific mission, brought to Juba. And then within Juba, Durkubeng was recruited and trained. And when the first bullet was fired, they were ready now to kill every single Nuer in town. Man, woman, child. All these massacres were committed. National security going around. When Julius Moy, a journalist, Asked President Kiir a question at the airport. What did the president say? He ordered him to be killed. And the same evening, the man was executed. Simply because he asked him a tough question. A journalist that was doing his job. 
asking about what is happening with resources, with corruption, things that every South Sudanese was seeing with their own eyes. He was killed. So external relations began to deteriorate. And they deteriorated because South Sudan was not true to the vision that they had mobilized the rest of the world around. And South Sudan began to have crisis internally because President Kiir was not true to the vision of New Sudan around which all the people of South Sudan rallied behind. That is why we've been subjected to this crisis. As I said, foreign policy is a mirror of national policy, of domestic policy. So if you have a domestic policy that is based of murder, based of thievery, based of lies, of course, relation will deteriorate. I keep giving example to what happened in 2012 when Salva Kiir came to New York to meet with President Obama. First of all, he came to the meeting very late. I will go into the details of why he came to the meeting very late later. He came to the meeting very late, and then in the meeting, he was asked a direct question. He lied to the President Obama in his face. It was about the support that South Sudan was giving to the SPLM North. Uh, these were the rebels from uh, Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile that were fighting against Khartoum after South Sudan independence, which of course, rightfully, were being supported by South Sudan. And when President Obama asked him, and he, we had been told, uh, we had been told many, 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 many weeks in advance that President Obama was going to ask this question and that let President Kiir be honest. Let him tell him that these are people that we fought together, the NCP refused, to implement the peace agreement in letter and spirit, and therefore popular consultations in Blue Nile and uh, in Nuba Mountain were never conducted, a BIA referendum were never conducted, and then when we were about to get our independence, Sudan government began attacking them. And since they are our brothers and we believe in the righteousness of their cause, we felt the least we could do was to give them support. Mr. President, he was supposed to ask President Obama, Mr. President, in your case, what would you have done? But instead of doing that, he decided to lie. And he said, no, we are not doing that. We are not supporting them. And then when President Obama said, look, here are the evidence, satellite evidence of what we have. And you cl clearly can see uh, SPLA, military intelligence people, giving weapons uh, to rebels from Blue Nile and Southern Cordo France. He then told President Obama <laughs> that your satellites are blind to his face. So President Obama stood up and said, thank you for coming, sir. See you. And that was the end of the conversation. Lying. Nation of liars. We were no longer speaking the truth. We were no longer true to the vision of this struggle. And that's because, unfortunately, we had a man, we brought a man to power that was clueless, had nothing in his head except the hat that he wears. That's it. And because of that, people of South Sudan began to perish. Relations that has taken years, decades, to build, they were dissipating before our eyes. When I met with the former minister of Norway, he told me the most horrible meeting he has ever had in his life was meeting Salva Kiir. That was the most horrible meeting he ever had in his entire life. He's now, by the way, uh, the, uh, working for the uh, World Economic Forum. He's my colleague at the World Economic Forum. He said the most horrible meeting he has ever had was with Salva Kiir. And I can imagine, because it's horrible when you meet with someone that has no compassion, has no sense of self-reflection, person who cannot take accountability over what he does, only blaming others. Well, I they can't react. Well, I they can't have forgotten. Then as Majanga God, Yahu Amul Kalamde, well I the Mama Rebecca Amul Kalamde, then as Daban Denga Amul Kalamde. The guy has no sense of personal responsibility, even managing his own family. Why are his children running mad in the market? Stealing everything. Who will he blame? Well I he Mishkala Bata Nazde. He will never take any single responsibility over his actions. And that is the real tragedy. Because a person that cannot reflect and take responsibility for what they do, they can never learn. At all, can never learn. And that is who Salva Kiri is. It's an individual 
that completely has no sense of reflection, of understanding where he might have gone wrong, always blaming others. He's the president. Every evening, degree is coming out, firing everyone. Everyone has been fired. And then they concocted this nonsense that is people around him that are bad and the president is good. Everyone around him has been removed. How many chief of general staff have we had? How many IGPs have we had? How many ministers of finance have we had? And it's the same, same, same problem. How many governors of the central bank? The only person that has remained constant is Salva Kiir and Akhal Kur. These are the only people that have always been there. So you cannot tell us that this guy is, 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 is good. And this is what he think in his head. Every time he's blaming a minister, he's blaming a governor, he's blaming so and so. And he's the one at the same time responsible for that. An individual without a sense of self-reflection. It's a sociopath. It's a sociopath. You saw what happened when, when the whole incident happened in, uh, in Gwaliar. Hmm? When uh, he had the incident with the flooding of the national anthem. What did he do? He arrested the journalists as if the journalists were the one that made him do it. Did anyone tell him, now go, do it? He did it on his own. And then he began to harass journalists. What were the journalists supposed to do? They were brought there to cover the event. This is part of a sense of a person that have no sense of self-reflection. He cannot control his own bowels, and then he want to blame other people for it. Cannot control his own bowels. And then he want to blame other people for it. This is the person who is running the nation. He cannot learn. He cannot reflect. The problem is always another person. He cannot do no wrong. Even his own bowels. Eh? His own bowels. That one you need to blame someone else. To arrest someone else. Send people to jail. My people. This is the person that is running the nation. So all the people in the world who did not know him. Because during the war, by the way, he was very good at manipulating people, make it, it seems that he is humble, he's a good guy, he's John Garang who's doing that and that. What people didn't realize, that this man is an individual that was completely a sociopath. He had like a psychological uh, condition, narcissist. That is the kind of person he is. So my people, uh, relations that we have now with the rest of the world are bad, and they have been destroyed. And it should not be a surprise. It's because of what is happening internally. You cannot have a country run by thieves. Right now, look at those are close around him. Those are Bolmel. Everyone knows that Bolmel is there is a tool that is used to loot the resources. Yeah. I posted before the map. You have people that are Islamists, those of Tutkel, with him, those of Nguyen Muntuil, those of Tonga Khan. These are people that we had gone to war, to fight against. And they are the one now running the nation. And we were arguing before that we want to build a free nation, a free nation, nation that was free of Islamic fundamentalism, only to recycle Islamic fundamentalists and bring them to the helm of power in Juba, making South Sudan a breeding ground, potentially, for terrorism. The way you see now all these extremists expanding their network in the country is extremely alarming. And every single one of you should be concerned about the future of South Sudan. That is because of this man called Salva Kiir. The same thing. Look at the poverty, as I said to you before, from 50% to 90% while the oil is flowing. Even now with the reduction in the oil, we are still getting $400 million a month. Where is that money going? Soldiers have not been paid since July. Yeah? Soldiers have not been paid since July. Where is the money going? It's going to his pocket, to his pocket. Gold. Adut is the one that is selling the gold. Huh? He's the one, she's the one selling the gold, the daughter of the president. She's the one selling the gold. She, and she's giving some of the money for herself. She's giving the rest to her dad. She is the one that is collecting taxes. Immigration is controlled by her. Every single money that is paid, it goes first to her pocket. And then now she decides what to give to the government and what to keep. That is the guy. He has sold the water to Egypt. They made him the chairman of the East Africa community so that they can annex our borders. And then they made him to actually bless 
to, to, to bless the, the terrible map, huh? the map in which the borders of South Sudan have been annexed, the Holy Lemi Triangle, which is blessed with some of the most fertile land uh, in the country, is blessed with gold, is blessed with oil. It has everything there. He has allowed the Kenya to take it. Look at what happened with the uh, part of the Eastern Equatoria, uh, some of the Didinga territory, Moyasukun, Shukudum. They have been annexed. Some of the Ye River uh, around Kejikeji, annexed by Uganda. Has he even said a single word once? No. Only last time to send people to Kenya, to Baringo, to go and say he's going to build a world-class hospital there. There is no single hospital in his own village. There's not even a clinic in his own village. He wants to go and build a world-class hospital in Baringo because he had crashed, his plane had crashed there in the 1990s, and these people somehow managed to save his passport. That is the guy in charge. You know? So it's no longer a wonder that the relations have deteriorated because the domestic policy that the rest of the world rally around and that the people of South Sudan rally around is no longer being honored, is no longer being implemented. And you have individuals in power that have no sense of reflection, has no sense of shame, have no sense of responsibility, blaming other people for things, things that he has done clearly, things that he has done clearly. You want to blame other people for it. So this is the guy that is leading, a sociopath, a foreign agent, individual that is not loyal to the national interest of South Sudan. He's tearing South Sudan apart, dividing the people of South Sudan, arming the communities of South Sudan so that they may kill each other. This is the individual that is in power. And this nation cannot begin to move forward without removing him. And removing him is the beginning of everything that has to be done. Every single South Sudanese must put that in their head. So one of the reasons why the relation with the rest of the world has failed, and this is the biggest reason, is because the national policy that Salva Kiir is, is implementing is a policy of thievery, of corruption, of murdering in form of the national security and arming communities to kill each other. It's a policy of lying exemplified by him. So that is number one. Number two, foreign policy has to be implemented by diplomats, people that are trained in the art of di diplomacy. You don't just wake up and you are a diplomat. You have to be trained. You have to go through it. Here in the United States, there are institutions that are there to train diplomats. People have to go there. You, you, you study it from undergraduate to master's level, and then when you are within the foreign affairs institution, you go for regular courses. You are trained in the languages, in the cultures of the nations that you are going to be dealing with. We have never done that. In fact, if you look at most of the people working in the Ministry of, fin of Foreign Affairs, they are just relatives. There are relatives or people that are close to the president. You find some people that are completely unqualified being appointed to head embassies in very strategic countries. It's a joke. A joke. You send somebody who is illiterate to be an ambassador in Washington, D.C. Hmm? You send a psychopath to be an ambassador in Belgium. Seriously? And you, you, you expect the other nation to take you seriously? You find all these relatives, matokraps, all over the place at the embassies, and they have no clue whatsoever of what is going on. When they're invited to functions, Many of them are just, I think my brother, Grang John, called them Gilweng in Sut. They just come there as if they are in their villages. They have no complete understanding whatsoever. Diplomacy requires preparation. Any serious function of the government requires skills. You are not just born with this. Yeah? No matter how gifted you are, you have to be trained. The same way that you don't just take anybody to, to, to war and expect them to be a soldier. They have to go for training and to be sh put in shape, to be indoctrinated so that they know what they are doing and what is their responsibility. We have diplomats, most of them, are completely unprepared 
for the function that they are given. That is another reason why our relations have changed and why we are a laughing stock of the world. Third reason, some of the best diplomats that we had had been kicked out because of jealousy. Huh? Some of the best. I know some of them. They have completely been removed and they have not been promoted because there are people within, around Kiyadit who don't like them. And they victimize them. These people have been kicked out. And the ones that are still there, they are not properly motivated. As we speak, the diplomats of South Sudan that are deployed all around the world, they have gone for 30 months without salaries. 30 months. 30 months without salaries. And they're in foreign nations. They have to pay rent. They have to send their kids to school. And the way it works also, the pay is not equal. There are individuals right now who are here in D.C. or New York, and they are getting their money. And then the rest of the people are not getting anything. Only those who are close to the president that are relatives, these are the people getting their money on time. Those who are just professionals, they get nothing. So it becomes a huge embarrassment. Now in, in, in European Union, in the U.K., here in the United States, there are so many court cases of local staff that work for the South Sudanese embassies that have not been paid and who have decided to sue the embassies. All these cases are being had. It's embarrassment for the nation. It make us a laughing stock of the world. Finally, and this is very important, the personal behavior of the president. How the president behaves. Because the president is the number one symbol of the nation. How he is reflect on the whole nation. If he is undignified, people are not going to be respected. You remember during the war, regardless of where you are, and by then many of us were still extremely poor because we had no money. But wherever you go, you were greeted with dignity by everybody. Why? Because John Grang was a great representative of South Sudan. He represented us very well. He articulated our issues very well. So when someone meet us, they want to talk to us. They say, well, you people are great people. You have a great leader. What about now? Now, you have a president when he is sent to the international institutions, like what happened in Arusha. He can't even speak. He can't even pronounce the names of other dignitaries in the room with him. He forgets who Museveni is. He forgets everything. He can't remember anybody. Can't remember anybody. He has no point that he's making. When he goes to talk at the UN, he can't even walk. Yeah? Just to lift his foot is a problem. He can't lift his foot. Yeah? He's walking like he's a dead man. And you expect South Sudan to be taken seriously when he's run by such a, an individual? Really? We shouldn't be surprised. He's late to meetings. And as I said last time, a lot of terrible things have happened. Yeah? Here in New York, he got lost one time in New York City, walking in the middle of the city, unaware where he's going. Go and he's been confined to hotels so many times, simply because of inability to control himself. This is the person. And then he wants to blame other people for those things. He doesn't want to take responsibility for it. He wants to blame other people for, for his own personal choices. If I choose to drink today and go to a meeting totally wasted, whose problem is it? Hmm? Whose problem is it? I'm the one who consumes my own alcohol. Yeah? You drink yourself to death, and then you want to go and do official function. That can happen. And that has become a terrible behavior, repeatedly. Decision, poor choices that are made by the president. This is one of the reasons that is really the primary reason that has made our country a laughing stock. See on TikTok the videos that the Kenyans have been making about South Sudan. The videos that Ugandans have been making about South Sudan. The videos that any foreigners of anywhere in the world have been making about South Sudan. And who do they use as the primary example? Salvakir himself. Salvakir himself. So this is it. This is it, my people. These are the reasons why our nation has been reduced to a laughing stock. Why great people 
of the Nile that have never yielded to tyranny, that have always stood tall against adversity, had been reduced to nothing. People laugh at us when they meet us. They ask you, if this country of you, country of yours doesn't have people, hmm? doesn't have people, this is why you have this guy to be the leader? There are no people in your nations? It's shameful and embarrassing. There is no point of life without dignity, without honor. Life is not about material wealth, the way that the family of Salva Kirha misunderstood. They're stealing everything in sight, and they are forgetting the true meaning of life, dignity. They have left any sense of dignity, any sense of shame. That's why you have the whole family in the market. Whole family is in the market. They have forgotten that it's not about the bread, about the stomach. They have made politics to be the politics of the belly, politics of matocratism. They have forgotten that dignity is what makes people people. And we, as South Sudanese people, doesn't matter what tribe, when you think about King Budwe, Zandeman, he was dignified, honorable. You think about Ngundeng Bong, he was a Nuer prophet, dignified, honorable. When you think about Ariat Makwe, was a Dinka priest, honorable, dignified. When you think about Konanok, was a di great Dinka chief, honorable, dignified. It's about the story that you leave behind. It's not about the mansions that you have in Morocco, the mansions that you have in Ethiopia, whatever, the, the, whatever all this money that you have stolen and put in the bank account. That is nothing. Without dignity, is nothing. And that is what our president had misunderstood. You, as people of South Sudan, we must reclaim our dignity. We must reclaim it. It's our duty to reclaim it. And the only way we can reclaim this dignity is by removing Salva Kiir. Each and every one of you has a role to play. Doesn't matter what your circumstances are. If you are a soldier and you have your gun, you have a role to play. If you are a, a priest, a bishop, you have a role to play. If you are a journalist and you have your pen, you have a role to play. You are a politician, you have a role to play. If you are in a diaspora and you make money, that little money of you, you yours, you have a role to play. I cannot tell you how exactly Salva Kiir will be removed. But what I know is that he must be removed and each and every one of you must use whatever you have, whatever within your power, to make sure that South Sudan is liberated and that South Sudan become dignified once more. Our duty is to make South Sudan great again, which can only happen once we remove Salva Kiir. That is the only way, my brothers and sisters. So let us continue let us go forth knowing that the prophecies that God Almighty has made in the land of the black people, the land of South Sudan, can only be fulfilled by the deeds of our action, what we will do by the works of our hands. And we can only begin to do that once we remove Salva Kiir. So please share the video. Doesn't matter, you are a matograp, you are a psychopath, you are a true patriot, you are a true son of the nation, daughter of the nation. Go ahead, share the video. Uh, have your say, make comments, uh, make sure that we hear your thoughts, uh, make your own videos as well, and let's keep the conversation going. But I assure you, this year, 2024, is the year we are freeing our nation of Salva Kiir removing that chapter of shame from the history of South Sudan, cutting it off forever. May God Almighty bless you, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with you. Thank you for joining us today.